we know that the, the purpose of yoga is to neutralize those fluctuations in, in consciousness. And there are a couple of different ways that, that different systems dig into that. Um, in the Yoga Sutras, and um, many teachers speak about this as well, probably because they've read the Yoga Sutras and their teachers have promoted this way of understanding. There is a description of how to clarify your consciousness, how to experience samadhi. And there are descriptions of different states of samadhi. So I know this is going to be a little bit of review, but it's going to help us get into it. And the ways of getting into that samadhi. Now, what's beautiful about the process that's described by Patanjali um, and teachers who are familiar with this work and have benefited from it is that it gives a very realistic and doable process compared to what we might be used to, which is when we hear the great yogis speak and they say, just do this and then you'll go into the bliss of samadhi and then just stay there. That's often what we are fed. That's often what we are, what we are told. But there is a step-by-step -step process in the Yoga Sutras, a description philosophy, but also a process uh, that can help us realistically achieve lower levels of samadhi and then higher levels of samadhi and then even freedom from all of that. Now, again, it does require that we have the ability to sit still, be quiet, and relax. Now, this is why I put so much emphasis on taking care of your body and your emotional, psychological nature, because if you do that, it's going to be much easier for you to sit still and trust that you're safe while you're meditating. And when you feel safe and alert while you're meditating, you've got all this time to explore your inner world, to develop this capacity for samadhi. It's like, you know, I have a basement with all kinds of tools and things to tinker with. Um, maybe there, if you've got a garden or a shed, something like this. Well, when you go into that space and you've got stuff to do that's interesting for you, you let the whole world go. When I'm working on a musical instrument or when I'm trying to build something, I'm not thinking about bills. I'm not thinking about classes I have to teach. I'm not thinking about um, issues I had from childhood. I am just there in the space, being creative, doing what needs to be done. And that's what we need to be able to do with our meditation practice. We need to have, we need to develop the capacity to go into our inner workshop and just for that period of time, get to work in what we're interested in, which is the inner world, the soul, the spirit, and that can be done. And that's what the yoga sutras are all about. So let's say that you're already relaxed. You're already feeling safe. You already have given yourself permission to let go of all the distractions of the world just for a little while. So what do you do? Well, in the Yoga Sutras, as I mentioned, there's these descriptions of samadhi, which are with support and without support. With support is still samadhi, although it is involving the thinking mind. And this is often traditionally what the role of mantras should be doing or yantras, you know, yantras are those geometrical patterns that you gaze at. Uh, mantras are those um, words or word phrases or Sanskrit phrases that you focus on and concentrate on. Most people have treated those things mechanically as though just by gazing at an image, that's going to do it. And maybe if you are quite advanced already, that's all you need to do because you don't have all the pools uh, distracting you. And maybe with a mantra, they act as though if you get this word phrase, that the, the, the resonance and the innate meaning of the mantra, even if you understand it or not, is going to wake you up. Okay. Um, again, maybe that's possible depending on your level of development. But for most of us who need to start leveling up, um, what you have to be able to do is understand what you're looking at and what you're saying mentally. You have to engage the thoughts. When we do the mantra Om Namah Shivaya, I describe it as though, in the way Mr. Davis described it to me, Om, which is the primordial vibration of consciousness, Om 
Nama. Nama means I acknowledge with reverence. Om Nama Shivaya, Shiva, one of the three um, profound godheads, representations of the infinite consciousness. Now, if you didn't know what that meant, sure, you could put yourself in a trance saying Om Nama Shivaya, Om Nama Shivaya, Om Nama Shivaya. And by putting yourself in a trance for a little while, you aren't distracted, but you're really just in a trance. When you come out of that trance, all the distractions just pour back in. Now, let's imagine that someone explains to you what Om Nama Shivaya means. And now, now this is, this, is, this is why people don't do it because it takes focus and energy and attention, and that's exhausting in the beginning or it can be if you're not used to it. Well, now when you chant Om Namah Shivaya, Om, you hear the word Om in your consciousness and you imagine, feel that consciousness is everywhere vibrating with this Om. We know that um, the physical structure is really just excited um, uh, molecules and, and atoms. We know that light is vibration. We know that sound is vibration. So essentially, really everything is a vibration and a manifestation of Om. And uh, Lihiri Mahasaya had even said, I believe it was him, one of the gurus, that the body, even the body is a manifestation of Om. So you start out Om, and you, in your mind, give yourself permission to become completely aware of that. Now we're just getting started. In order to do that, don't you have to give yourself permission to release attention from all your distractions? Don't you have to give yourself permission to walk down into the basement into your workshop and let all that stuff go? Yes. Om. So it's not just Om to hear yourself say it inside. It's Om. And you are acknowledging this infinite vibration in all things. Nama. Nama. I, I acknowledge with reverence. I bow. I give respect. Have you ever been around anyone that you've respected? I mean, really respected, that you utterly just felt wonderful, that you had the opportunity just to be there with them, to learn from them. Um, I felt that way around Mr. Davis every time I was around him. I was just so grateful to be there in his presence. So that's a feeling, that's a state. It's not just a acknowledgement of words. Om Nama. So now you're, you're, you're bringing up a state of, true reverence. And in order to do that, you have to let go of everything else. Om Namah Shivaya, Shiva, the infinite consciousness. The, the, you can think of him as kind of, in a way, the Lord of the universe. He's an aspect of that. Ishvar is Lord of the universe. But you can think of Shiva as this, this infinite aspect of divinity. Now imagine if you were truly there giving respect to divinity, how would you feel? Well, every time you do the mantra, that's what you're, that's what you're meant to be doing up here and in the heart, of course, too. And think about it. If you, with every chant of Om Namah Shivaya, you brought up the sense of respect, you brought up this feeling, this imagination of being in the presence of divinity, and you felt the vibration of Om, or imagine that you could feel it all around you, would you have time to really be worried or concerned with anything else? No, you wouldn't. And I'm saying this like it's easy, and it's not, at least it wasn't for me. It takes time for you to go into your workshop and get settled. It takes time for you to really look at that mantra, Om, and feel it out inside. It takes time for you to remember when you really respected someone or something, namha, and to, and to flood your awareness with that, shivaya, to imagine the infinite divine. Now, in the beginning, most of us are weak, meaning we feel that we're at the mercy of all this stuff that bothers us or distracts us or irritates us. Well, that's because our consciousness <clears throat> has allowed it to happen that way. It's like we have... We have not said get out. We, it's, have you ever been in a relationship with friends that were just parasitic or with people that were just selfish? You eventually had to say, get out, get out, you know, just get out. And the more you had those boundaries, the more they went away and the more good people came into your life. Well, this is the, the crucible, the, the alchem, alchem, alchemical work that we are doing with yoga. And it's so simple. And by doing this, 
Om. You are telling yourself Om and you're imagining Om however you can. I don't care how you do it. You just have to get in there in your own way. And that is um, Samadhi with support. You are using your thoughts. You are using your imagination to get in there and create this groove, to, to create this groove. It's like drawing on a piece of paper. Every time you run that pencil over the paper, it shades a little bit deeper. And so it's really white at first. You can barely see it. But then the more you focus on Om, the shade gets deeper, the shade gets deeper, the shade gets deeper until there's just the shade, the, the, the pencil marking that you, you just can't ignore it. Nama Shivaya. Okay, then you might have to say things like, I respect the infinite consciousness. I respect the divine. I respect God. You are telling yourself that while trying to feel it in your body. Now, that is the first stage of samadhi. And what you are doing is you are reconditioning your chitta, your consciousness. The state of your chitta is the way it is because of habit. That's it whether it's habit that's conscious or unconscious. So what yoga is doing is it is redefining your habit of awareness consciously. Does this make sense what I'm trying to say? Yeah, okay. And that takes as much time as it takes depending on how scattered you are. You know, in one of my books, uh, I believe it's A Course in Tranquility, I say that it is as difficult for a yogi to be scattered, it's, it's actually more difficult for a yogi to be scattered than it is for a beginner to focus because the yogi has done a heck of a lot of work. And so it becomes natural to stay in that point of oneness. Um, so anyway, the first stage of samadhi is with support, which means you have to use your words. You have to use your mind and you, you, you're essentially talking to yourself so much that everything else gets, gets uh, it, it's, you talk to yourself so loudly about what you want to focus on that everything else just goes away. It's like, you know, covering your ears when blah, 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 when, when you don't want to hear what someone else is saying, except you're doing it with a, a point of focus that is like a mantra or is uh, something to consider. Now that's a mantra. I don't have one of the images here that I use. Um, you can use a statue, um, but like, for example, I've described, I have uh, images of um, Vishnu and images of uh, Lakshmi, uh, Ganesh. And uh, I didn't go buy these, but I really liked Rudraksha beads. And there was a place in India that I got Rudraksha beads from. And every time I ordered them, they ended up sending me these pictures of these, these gods and goddesses. And I finally decided I'm going to, I'm going to, put them to work. And so the images of the gods and goddesses, yes, they are there for to, to direct your devotion and your attention, but what they're really there for is to absorb your mind in the samadhi of their, of what they represent. So, um, you know, if you see uh, a goddess uh, holding a hook in her hand or having the hand up in, in blessing and you research, I recommend researching when you see these images of the gods and goddesses, what does each symbol mean in that picture? Because those pictures are rich with symbolism. And now imagine that you're gazing at it. And again, what I do is I imagine that these images of the gods and goddesses are, are huge. I mean, just beyond life size, uh, towering, like the size of a building, and that there's a radiant light behind them. And I immediately begin to imagine what would it feel like if I was truly in the presence of this amazing profound, radiant being. And that starts to shift my consciousness immediately. And then I start thinking about, okay, so Vishnu has a discus. What does that represent? And I, I contemplate that. And that's keeping my attention on that image of the divine. And then I think about Vishnu having his hand up and blessing. And then I imagine that, I imagine light pouring out of his hand and shining through all of the space all around me and through my body. And what would my body really feel like if this radiant beam of light coming from the God of all gods was pouring through every pore of my body, what would that feel like? And I'm getting engaged in it. And anyway, I go through all of the process. That is a lower form of samadhi, but it's still samadhi because all I'm focused on is Vishnu. Everything else is, is not there. So this is a lower form of samadhi. And this is how you get into it. Ways like this. Kriya Pranayama is the same way. Many people mechanically do it pull it up, and then they imagine they just let it flow back down. Well, take your time with it. Really feel 
the spine. Really feel a cool, soothing sensation rising up through each level of the body. I mean, just remember when you've gotten a massage or you've had someone touch you and it was very pleasant. Imagine that same pleasant feeling. Doing that alone is already going to start releasing all kinds of feel-good hormones. And it's going to be much easier for you to practice contentment and purity and harmlessness and truthfulness because you feel good. When you feel good, those things are easy. So you want to get into it. And again, this is a type of samadhi with support. Now, how long do you do samadhi with support? That depends on you. You have to continuously do this until eventually you break through to that next stage, which is samadhi without support, which means now, let's use Kriya Pranayama. Now you have circulated the life force through the spine and you have gotten into it so deeply that you can stop, but it's as if it continues. It's as if the feeling continues in the spine. And then it's like, you can't help but not feel it. Again, if we think about the lower forms of our experience, think about anger. How many times have you been angry about something? And no matter how much you try to stop thinking about anger, you still keep getting angry. Well, that's because you have practiced samadhi with anger so much that you're able to experience samadhi with anger without support very easily. So this is possible. And this is what yoga is doing is it's training us to go the other direction instead of samadhi without support with anxiety or samadhi without support with depression or samadhi without support with fear. You know, it's there anyway. Now what we're doing is we're going in and we're reprogramming this body mind unit so that that which is natural is calmness. That which is natural is non-judgment. That which is natural is compassion. That which is natural is um, openness. Um, and this, this is a very real thing that you can do. It's not just an esoteric thing. Um, one person I know who's a neuroscientist discussed uh, a brain, doing a brain scan of a, of a uh, was he a Tibetan monk? Some, some type of monk of that persuasion. And he had focused on... I believe it was sort of the idea of compassion or loving kindness so strongly and so consistently for the duration of his life that whatever brain regions are associated with that, when they did the brain scans of him, he couldn't turn it off. It was so, it was so, the chitta, the consciousness had become so conditioned towards that, that the, the physical structure of the brain itself couldn't turn it off. So this is what we're doing now. How do we get to samadhi without support and stay there? Um, that is just practice and patience. Because the more you focus on these things that we're discussing, you'll find that naturally for a few minutes or even a few hours afterwards, it persists. But then life happens and your old conditioning comes back in. The old habits, the old patterns come back in. And you start to get overwhelmed and you start to get thrown off course, just a little bit. And then you're kind of back to what you're used to, how you're used to feeling as your small sense of self. And so that's why you do it again in the evening. But then as the years go by, it becomes longer and longer and longer so that if you want to sit there and all you want to do is feel uh, the fire element is my favorite element to meditate upon. You can sit there and you can abide there almost forever until you got to get up or go pee or do whatever you need to do because you have conditioned your consciousness to stay there. Again, when I think about playing music, it's the same thing. When I first started playing music live, I was distracted by everything. You know, the person in the audience, the string being slightly out of tune, the, the way my shoe feels. But as time went on and the more I practiced live with, with a band and with an audience, I don't even think about it. I just get my instrument out and I just play. And if it sounds terrible, I don't even care because I'm so in the zone and, and I've got years of directing my consciousness, my chitta in that way. So this is what we're doing. And that is how you're going to move from a place of just fighting your consciousness all the time. You don't want to fight it. You want to retrain it, fighting your consciousness all the time. You're going to move from that to being able to be a master of your consciousness. And 
you learn to become comfortable in that space where you're trying and you're thinking that's still samadhi, but then you have to learn to let go a little bit. It's like, you know, when I've tried to learn a bike without, without my hands, you know, on handlebars, you kind of, I'm not very good at it still, but I keep trying. I see people doing it all the time and I want to do it where you can just take your hands off the bike and people can just keep going. Well, it's like that. You have to hold on with the samadhi with support, but then in time, you just got to let go a little bit and maybe you only do it for three seconds and you got to hurry up and grab back again. And you go back to telling yourself stuff, but then eventually it gets longer and longer and longer that you can lift your hands off that handlebar of the bike until finally you're just going and you're not, you don't have any control with your hands. The same thing is the way meditation works. So you're going to be going back and forth between holding on with support and letting go a little bit, seeing how long it lasts and then holding on and eventually you let it go. Now, um, what is the process, the yogic process um, that I want to share with you that Sri Yukteswar has talked about, that other yogis have talked about that is in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, particularly in chapter three that ties all of this together. Let's talk about that. Okay, so this next um, discussion, you all know the chanting through the chakras meditation practice, chanting through the chakras. This is a probably alongside Kriya Pranayama, one of the most powerful meditation techniques you can actually engage in. <laughs> And it's such a shame that it's not treated that way. And the reason it's not treated that way is because in order to really get the full effect of it, you got to have some background information. And that, that in itself could probably be a week of training. Um, but let's discuss why chanting through the chakras is so important and how you can learn to get into it and, and see and experience just what it's, what it's all about. Okay. So first of all, Chanting through the chakras is ideally bringing attention to different centers of the body, different um, endocrine, nervous, um, blood flow centers of the body. There's important, important stuff going on in those areas where the chakras are. Um, those are considered to be psychophysiological centers. Uh, in the theory of Kriya Yoga, our karmas, or the way we see the world, our samskaras, how our consciousness our chitta is conditioned while well, yes, it's in the brain, but it's also within our field. And many things are stored within each specific area of the body. And that's why, you know, when you think about the heart, there is a sense of compassion and love there because the heart has an association with it. When you think about the lower chakras, like the second chakra, which is, is the area of the genitals, well, that's an area of creativity, of um, more power and energy. And what do we do with the genitals? Well, we create the most amazing things in the world, which are human bodies. Um, when we think about the first chakra, this is a level of basic survival, of endurance, of perseverance. So each of these chakra centers, psychically, physiologically, psychologically um, hold different kinds of uh, conditionings. And we're not gonna get into this too much, but in, in astrology, that's really one of the beautiful things about astrology if it's treated as a spiritual science, not a predictive science, but a science that can actually help you figure out this body mind unit and get on with it, is that uh, the zodiac itself, um, is each, each sign is related to a positive and negative manifestation of a chakra. And so where you see planets and where you see planetary energies, it's going to point out where there is great support in a chakra area, or it's going to point out where there's a big hang up or a big snag. Um, so that's really the beauty of, of astrology from a yogic perspective. Um, but while that can be helpful, what's really the important part is all we really need to do is bring our attention to different areas of the body. And by holding our awareness there, we are bringing light, clarity. We are bringing expansiveness, which means if there are hangups or if there are 
things that are conditioning us, um, by simply bringing attention there and breathing, we are releasing those things. We are becoming freer. So we know um, Kriya Pranayama circulates life force through the spine. And what that's doing is it's circulating life force along these chakra centers. It's almost like by pulling the current up and letting it flow back down, you can imagine there's like a little wheel or a, um, a fan there. And every time awareness comes up through it, it spins that fan. And whatever's stored in there, which is blocking you from your true nature, it gets just dissolved or, or removed, like you're spinning a fan and stuff is flying off of it. Well, when you're doing chanting through the chakras, the same thing is occurring. Um, when you bring your attention to the root chakra and you, the key to it is you really have to feel the area, meaning just like when you're contemplating Om, what is Om? What is Nama? What is Shivaya? Well, now you need to go in and you need to feel the uncomfortableness if it's uncomfortable or the ease of the root chakra, the, the point that you're probably sitting on if you're sitting on a chair and you chant Lum, 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 lum. And if you feel that lum, that seed syllable vibrating within that space, that is, in a sense, we could say, this is a metaphor, by the way, don't take this literally, spinning that chakra, and it is clearing it out. And then you bring your awareness up to the second chakra, and you do the same thing. But you have to feel the area. And for many people, this is uncomfortable because, you know, many people feel a lot of tension and, and fear in their heart and they don't want to experience it. Many people who've experienced sexual abuse or sexual trauma don't want to pay attention to their lower uh, chakras because maybe they're going to become aware of some stuff. And again, this is why I highly recommend having a professional to deal with things that you might not be able to deal with on your own. Maybe when they come to the third chakra, there's a sense of hum humiliation or humans all have, we've got all kinds of weird things that have happened to us and that's where they are stored. And it is those points of storage or that conditioning, which prevents us from just sitting around and saying, ah, oh, this is the infinite consciousness. I'm supremely free. Everything is great. I can't wait to see what the next moment brings, even if it's terrible. And I'm ready to die at any moment because I know I'm an immortal spiritual being. That's it's all that stuff that prevents you from accepting that. So by going through chanting through the chakras, you are, you are bringing awareness there and freedom there and strength there. But we have to understand that sometimes strength requires facing some hard stuff. And I thought about this last night. Um, I've always been drawn to Kali, the goddess Kali. And, and it's like, I always, it's like, I've just had a, I've just put a spiritual sign on my back that says, just please kick my ass constantly because Kali is a goddess of, of, of destruction. She's the end of the ego. She is the most hideous thing that people, that people want to see because it's the end of them. But for yogis, she is the supreme, most beautiful goddess. I mean, I even, I even have a yantra for Kali on here. And I remember when I was, um, probably just before I was ordained, um, I had learned about this mantra, the most powerful Kali mantra that existed. And for some reason I thought, great, let's do that. Um, because it, it, it explained the mantra as though, if you want to burn through your karma as fast as you can, Kali will do it for you. And me being stupid, I didn't quite know how it worked. Um, I did that mantra for about a month. I committed to it. I did it for a month and probably three quarters of the way through. I remember Melissa coming home, from work, or I think she was in mass, her master's program then. And I was laying on the floor crying. She couldn't get me to like make sense of anything because I was just so overwhelmed with who knows what. I mean, I was a wreck. And um, she said, do you think maybe you should stop doing that mantra? I was like, nope. <laughs> like I, I decided I was going to do it. And so I am. And I finished it. Um, and I, I realized I, I I saw this book I was reading, there was a yantra for Kali and a mantra. And sure enough, that's the first one I went to. I saw it, I read the mantra and I thought that is a beautiful mantra. And I thought, Brian, come on, relax a little bit. Give yourself some mercy. And so I, I, I pulled away from it. And, um, and what I, I realized was, why did I worship Kali? Why was I such, you, you've seen my Saturn tattoo over here. Why did I worship Saturn? Well, Saturn is the God of, 
or the planet and the God of poverty, of desperation, of endurance, of just getting through the most horrible things. But he's also the God of truth, which means if you can handle all that, you're probably all right. Why did I do that? I did that because I had the false belief that by worshiping Kali and worshiping Shani, that's Saturn's name, that I would be spared, that I wouldn't have to go through the stuff that you have to go through to realize what Kali wants you to realize or what Saturn wants you to realize. For many, 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 too many years, that's what I believed until eventually what occurred to me that by doing mantras for Kali and mantras for Saturn and fasting for Saturn, I was essentially saying, hey, come into my life, show me the truth of things. And the way they teach truth is brutal. Um, and now I appreciate that, but it's not easy <laughs> and it can be pretty hard sometimes. And we have to remember this because this is the way of yoga. I don't mean to say that it's brutal and you're going to damage yourself, but think about it. You know, what, who is the Lord of yogis? Shiva. And what is Shiva's job? He, he's the one that dances away and destroys the universe. I mean, I wonder if anyone ever thinks about that. <laughs> he, he dances the dance of destruction. <laughs> but really, we have to remember that that is not a bad thing because the destruction is the destruction of our false sense of self. That is why when you open up these books on yoga and all of the mantras, all of the yantras are to these dark aspects of the goddess, Durga, uh, Kali, um, and so on, because they are the things which purge us of all that false stuff so that we can see what is real and what is true. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because you have to be aware, and this is often why it's not stressed to really get into this kind of practice, because we don't know who's got support and who doesn't. As you're going through it, as you are feeling these different areas of your body, things may come up and it's not bad. Hopefully you can handle it. And if you can breathe through it and if you can feel it, then yes, yoga can be enough for you to release these, these samskaras, these traumas, these conditionings, because they can be good too. You can have beautiful feelings in there too. It's not just bad stuff. And um, the more you do that, the more you go through the process in the beginning, if you're not strong enough, if you're not used to it, yes, it feels exhausting and it feels like, geez, what am I getting myself into? But eventually it's like when you start a training program, once you get into it and you're past all the soreness and the bitching and moaning about how hard it is, then you feel strong. And then you feel like, yeah, this is worth it. And you feel stronger and stronger each day. So we have to be aware of that hump. And we also have to be aware of the fact that what we are doing is clearing out not only stuff that we've experienced, it's, it's a, it's a, it can be a, a, a more global kind of experience because human suffering is universal. It's not just, it's not just yours, but the more you bring awareness to it and the more you see, oh, okay, this isn't me. This is an experience. And you're not dissociating. You're not jamming it back down there. You're just seeing it for what it is. Then you become more and more aware of what you are internally and you become freer. And then you are able to respond appropriately to difficult situations. You're able to respond appropriately to joyous situations without neurotically clinging to things. And then you are free. So chanting through the chakras, if you can really get into it, and again, how you do that is up to you, is a really wonderful experience. If you hit places where you become aware of uncomfortableness or difficulty, just breathe a little bit deeper, breathe through it, or get up and go for a walk. And when I say go for a walk, I mean swing your arms so that you know, you've got that cross lateral movement um, or go for a run or a bike ride. This is one thing that I do when something comes up for me in meditation. I, I don't dwell on it, but I remember it. And then I go for a walk. And as I'm walking, I'm feeling it. I pull it back up because as you walk, and this is why exercise is so important. As you walk, as you bike, as you run, as you do something that, that moves your arms up and down and get your legs moving, you are resetting the brain or do alternate nostril breathing because that's harmonizing the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And if there is an issue there that you have to deal with or, pro or process, that will help you do it. And hopefully you can do it on your own. If not, then go talk to somebody. 
but the more you do it, the clearer you become. Now, what is the specific, getting more specific here, the specific technique? Well, this deals with the elements. And each chakra is related to um, an element. So the root chakra, the very base of the spine is the earth element. The second chakra is the water element. The third chakra is the fire element. The heart chakra is the air element. The throat area um, is the ether element, akasha. And um, what you do is really very simple. You're gonna to have to write some stuff down, not right now, I mean, you can if you want, but you're gonna to have to kind of think this out for you. So what do you do? Well, you're going to do your practice just like you always would, chanting through the chakras. You're going to bring your awareness down to the root chakra. Now, as you feel the root chakra, what you're doing is you are um, imagining, attuning to, contemplating, learning to practice samadhi with the earth element. Now, the reason this is so important, because these are the building blocks of, of our, our physical consciousness. And so how do you do that? It's simple. You begin thinking about all of the stuff that relates to the earth element that you can be aware of. For me, um, heaviness. So I contemplate the feeling of heaviness. I, I imagine rocks. I think about rocks and like their hardness and their, their strength and their color and their roughness. And all in my mind's eye, I'll imagine mountain ranges, big, sharp mountain ranges that are rock and even um, mountain ranges that are uh, old and are covered with trees because those trees are being supported by the strength of the earth. I'll think about maybe coldness because the earth feels cold to me. I'll think about gravity because gravity holds together the, the, the atoms and the molecules which make the physical structure, which is earth. I'll feel the bones in the body and I'll go through all of the bones in the body as though the skeleton itself is a solidified aspect of the earth element. And I'll continuously do that over and over. And that, that is a very short list. I have a very long list. So you would make a list of everything that you relate to the earth element. And then you would focus on the root chakra and you would just contemplate the earth element, the strength of the earth within the body, that which holds you upright, which protects your organs because your bones protect your organs. And you contemplate that. And then you begin to practice letting go of the words. So now we're moving into samadhi without support. And so now you are feeling the bones. You are feeling the heaviness. You are imagining that durability, that strength, that roughness of the earth element. And you're just feeling it. And this takes practice. And after you do that, you're still focusing on the root chakra. That's the point of, of anchor, the point of focus. Um, now you let it go, meaning you just observe. And this is a, a, um, a simplified version of this whole process, but this is enough to get you into it. And then we can talk about the more detailed process a little later, like a year or two from now. Um, then what you do, the very final phase, once you have felt it, and you have, you've practiced it with support, talking about it, thinking about it, and then you've just observed it. The final phase is existing and then acknowledging that everything that you've thought about, everything that you've felt, the earth element, the, the, the great earth element itself exists for the seer, you, the witness. So you have witnessed it, you have observed it, you have felt it. So all of that experience of the earth element has existed for the sake of the seer. And this is talked about in the Yoga Sutras, that, that all this universe, this world exists for the sake of the seer. So if we go element by element, we are going through that process in the Yoga Sutras of realizing the truth of our nature. So it is feeling the chakra, step one. Step two, using every word, every bit of imagination you can, getting into the experience of what is the earth element all about, telling yourself about it so that everything else falls away. And you do that long enough that it's built up momentum that just for a little bit, all you have to do is sit there and, and watch as the, as the mind, as the body continues to feel and, and see and think about that stuff. And that's the, that's the subtle part that's going to take some practice probably. 
But then once that starts to fade and it becomes harder to, to stay with it, then all you do is you just remember, you pull back into the witness of the seer and you acknowledge this exists for the seer, for the, the self, the, the eternal witnessing presence. And you just hang out there for a minute or two. And then you move on to the next chakra, the water element. So whereas you were engaged in earth, now it's water. Well, what I like to do is I immediately remember, uh, I, I live near a river and I like to go swimming and paddle boarding. So I'm in the water a lot. Or if you've taken a bath or just been in the rain. So you just imagine what does it feel like to have water on the body? Or if you've been in a bathtub or if you've been in a hot tub or a pool or a lake, how your body feels heavy, but buoyant as though it's slightly floating. So you're imagining the quality of water as this buoyancy, this heaviness, but it's like light and spacious. And then you can imagine the wetness, the coldness of water, the slipperiness of water. You can imagine the feeling of like rain running down your body, or you can imagine when you've breathed in mist and you can feel the water within the body, the heartbeat pumping blood through the, the liquid moving through the body, through the, the blood. You can imagine water permeating the earth of the body because you know water permeates earth moving through the lymphatic system the brain floats in water actually liquid and so essentially what you're doing is you're imagining all these qualities of water around you in the body in your mind you can even in your mind see oceans i like to imagine waves rolling in or storms and you're with support focusing on water while holding your attention at the water element. You do this for as long as you can. And then you let all that go and you simply sit and watch and observe feeling <clears throat> the water in the body. Feeling the sense of buoyancy the water would have if you were in water. Feeling the moisture in the skin feeling all these things. And again, you stay there for a while until it becomes a little hard to stay there. And then again, you pull back as the seer, the witness, and you acknowledge all that I've experienced as water exists for the sake of the seer. And again, this is in the Yoga Sutras. And so what are you doing? You are harmonizing the elements within you, the great elements within you. You are bringing your awareness to each chakra. So you are also neutralizing any karmas or some scars or conditioning in those chakras. And at the same time, you are practicing vichara actually, right? Where you are pulling back and recognizing, acknowledging the seer, your true nature as it relates to the elements. And the beauty of all of this is you do this a lot. And there's a few things that occur. In the Yoga Sutras, let's see if I can find the exact one. Um, each of these kinds of practices, they're called uh, san, uh, sanyamas, um, which develop the capacity for samadhi. Uh, each of these practices uh, has like a promise that comes with it. Um, let's see if I can find it here. I'll have to look it up and share it with you when we do the meditation later on today. Chapter. Um, but the, the promise of kind of going through the elements is adamantine hardness. So health, it helps, it helps to support the health of the body so that you can meditate better. Um, but it also gives mass, it says it gives mastery over the elements. And many people interpret that to mean, oh, you can make it rain or call down lightning or start fires with your hands. It's not what it means. It means that you are becoming a master, recognizing the real you and its relationship to the physical world. And the more that you develop a healthy and accurate relationship with the physical world, naturally the happier you become, because it's like the great sage who can interact in the world with his body, but he knows he's not his body, which means he can do what he needs to do. But if something happens to his body, he doesn't freak out. So this is teaching you more so how to exist as the seer, to recognize the truth of yourself as the seer and the elements as, in a sense, the not servant of, 
but they're there. The, the elements, this life experience is there for the seer, for spiritual growth, for awakening. Um, so you do this with all of the elements. And we're just going to have to go through it, really. Uh, and we'll do it probably a few times this week, but definitely at uh, our, our session, meditation session today. And, and this expands your awareness. Um, it's really a profound process. And it's spoken of in the Yoga Sutras. Sri Yukteswar talks about it. Uh, other yogis talk about it. But it's so overlooked because it's not necessarily easy. And it takes commitment. But once you get into it, it's a blast. I mean, I've got to say, like I said, the, the fire element is my favorite element. And um, well, I'll talk about it briefly, and then we'll, we'll practice later. Uh, the fire element is related to, yes, the heat in the belly. So it helps you digest things like fire does. It cooks things. But it's also related to the nervous system, the, the electricity that runs through the nervous system. And if you're meditating on the fire in the body, and the electric electricity and the electricity in the nervous system, and you get in, into it, then you move on to the field of electricity all around you. Because whether you can sense it or not, there's electromagnetism all around you. And you move into that. And the, the solar system itself, the movement of the planets, the sun to the moon, that's all generating this electromagnetism, which is a, a subtler but immense field. And you start contemplating that. And then you start contemplating into the galaxies and you go on beyond the galaxies to those huge clusters of, of networks of energies that the galaxies make up. And it's so big and so alive that it's, it's a profound experience. Um, the same thing has happened with the water element. You know, the water element can hold a lot of emotional pain. It's certainly because emotions are related to water. But once you get through all that, the water element is joy. And it's so weird because it's like as if you start feeling joy throughout the body. And why is the water element joy? Because water really is like lubrication or um, comfort. You know, when you're when you're riding in a car, if the car is well lubricated and well and, and it's comfortable, there's enough cushion, there's enough support, there's enough uh, that kind of buoyancy that water has. It's a smooth ride. If your life, when you've got a lot more of this this water element, that's why devotion is so important which is related to water. When you've got more of that in there, even when you hit big bumps in the road, when you've got that support of the comfort and the lightness, you don't notice it as much versus someone who's completely devoid of devotion and water and is dry. And so every bump breaks a bone because there's no uh, cushioning there. Um, so each of the elements is also related to a particular kind of um, uh, experience which uh, helps you as the yogi while you're embodied navigate life. But the, the difference here is that's why you always pull back as the seer because you're not getting caught up in it to say, oh, I love water so much. That's all I want to be. You're not attaching yourself to it because that's part of the problem in the first place. You are pulling back and recognizing that the element is there for the seer. So contemplation on states beyond gross modifications of the mind unveils the coverings that confine the self. So we are contemplating, when I say the elements, yes, we are using like physical ideas to get into it. But when we're contemplating the elements, these are like the great elements. Uh, the, that's like the blueprint for all of the elements. So when we contemplate these states, which are beyond the gross, the mind eventually loses the coverings, which veil the sense of self. And so the more we do this, those veils get less and less. By knowing the distinction between the attributes of nature and the self, and by mastering the senses, supremacy over all states of consciousness is acquired. So this is telling us this is how we become uh, an accomplished or master yogi. By knowing the distinction between the attributes of nature, so the attributes of nature are the elements, and the self. We focus on the element, then we pull back. What is the self? The self is that which is able to experience and see the attributes of nature. It's washing the consciousness. You're looking at the element and then you're pulling back and recognize, no, there is something which observes this. It is the seer, whatever that is, I'll figure it out. But you're, you're seeing the difference between the two. 
And by, con- by concentrating inwardly in this way, you are naturally mastering the senses. Because in order to go inward and to focus on these things, you can't be focused, you can't be noticing smells and you can't be uh, distracted by lights outside because you are internalized. You are internalized in this inner world, this inner contemplation. And so by doing these three things repeatedly through this practice, and it's said that you get supremacy over all states of consciousness. And then, of course, it goes on to say that um, this can result in perceptions of omnipresence and omniscience, which is omnipresence being everywhere present and omniscience uh, having uh, kind of like eternal knowing. And this is part of the process. This is in the Yoga Sutras, Chapter 3, and it ties into how to experience states of samadhi the lower states and the higher states. Um, So I I hope this was helpful for you. Um, If you you start practicing it, even if you don't go into the elements, if if you just take the idea that we've talked about, that we've touched upon on lower samadhi, using your mind, using your imagination, doing whatever it takes to get into it. And then the higher states of samadhi, when you begin to just be present with that momentum without the thinking, this really ignites your, your, your inner work and your spiritual practice. Okay. Well, since there were no questions uh, popping up, we will just go ahead and conclude here because that's the end of uh, the thoughts that I had for today that I wanted to share with you.